Hello and welcome to the Science of Sport. I'm Ross Tucker. Let me start by saying Happy New Year and I hope that 2016 is a very successful and prosperous year for you and that you achieve every single one of your high performance goals regardless of what domain they may be in. 2016 is going to be a big year in sport. Obviously the centerpiece will be the 2016 Olympic Games in August but either side of that there's going to be athletics, there'll be marathons, there'll be cycling and hopefully not quite as many doping controversies as there were in 2015, although I certainly won't be holding my breath on that one. I'm going to start 2016 on a slightly more optimistic note with the first installment of my talent identification and management series. You might recall a few weeks ago I posted a video in which I introduced the series saying that I'd recently given two presentations. One was to the English Football Association the second was to the English Rugby Football Union, where I spoke to a group of coaches and talent scouts and development officers about some of the strategic and tactical challenges that face talent ID and management. And what I'm going to do is take that presentation and splice it into smaller segments and then talk you through some of the slides as I film these videos so that you can see exactly what went into some of the concepts that I tried to share with those audiences. As always, I welcome your comments, your feedback, your discussion, dialogue, even your criticisms. Throw them my way and I will do my best to catch and respond to each of those. This, however, is installment number one. It deals with some of the fundamental questions that face talent identification and management, as well as the justification for why talent ID is so important. Right, so to begin with... My perspective or approach to this topic of talent ID and management is to start from the strategic, then go tactical, and then operational. And when I talk about operational, I'm talking about the tools that you would use as a coach or a scout or a teacher, parent, when you're actually involved with youth sports on the ground. And I'm not um, afraid to admit that that's not my area of expertise. So things like peak height velocity, uh, psychological profiles of youth athletes, the physiological predictors of future performance, these are things that other people are far more qualified than I am to talk about. So my, my approach is to talk about the concepts of talent ID and management, and, and that means thinking a little bit bigger. And I find that quite helpful when it comes to this topic, because honestly, if you asked 100 people to define talent, you'd probably have disagreement even on the most basic of definitions and that means that it's enormously complex. How do you optimize something that you can't even define? So to, to guide thinking a little bit, my approach, and that's not unique to this concept of talent, it's the same for anything, is to come up with the fundamental questions that will help you stay focused on what is really important. And for me, the most crucial question or concept around talent ID is the following. It's January 2016, as you're sitting there watching and listening to this. The objective of talent ID is to look into the future and to produce in, say, 2028, an athlete who is capable of winning an Olympic gold medal, a world title, or a player who's able to win a World Cup. So that means that we're looking ahead 12 years, or, or however many you wish to look, and we're looking for someone who will be that champion at the age of 25. Therefore, working backwards, that person is 13 years old today. And the fundamental question in talent identification and development is where is he or she now? That's the key. Can we answer that question? If the answer is yes, then your system is working. If the answer is that you have no idea, then you're hoping for dumb luck. And in order to be able to answer that question, there are some sub-questions that you have to be able to answer. So number one is, does he or she look like a future champion yet? Do we have the tools to identify him or her? And, and actually, I would add to that the systems to identify him or her. Because if we think about Jamaica or Kenyan long-distance running, doping jokes aside, they have systems in terms of school participation and clubs that allow them to identify athletes without needing massively sophisticated tools and organized systems and structures. It's, it's just organically done in those countries. And then the third one is, once identified, what should he or she do for those 12 or 13 years? And so there's a famous poem, perhaps not as famous as the one that uh, greets tennis players when they walk out onto center court at Wimbledon, but it's by the same author, Rudyard Kipling, 
And he says, I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. And of course, this who is the fundamental object of talent identification and development. Who is that future champion? But once you've identified that person, then you can start to ask the subsequent questions of the other five honest serving men. So we would ask, for instance, what should that young athlete or potential champion be doing? When should it be done? So this goes to concepts like specialization and relative age effect. How should it be done? Which is really a, a subject for coaches and those involved in the teaching of sports and skills and psychology to deal with. And then with whom? So that means who do we put in that young athlete's life along that pathway from a, an aspirant 12 or 13 year old to a 25 year old champion? Who are going to be the people who we want them to interact with over that period? So that leaves us with concepts as well as specifics or the content of Talent ID. And as I said up front, my focus is overwhelmingly on the concepts more than it is the content and the specifics. So when we talk about concepts, we're talking about strategy and tactics. We'll talk about specialization, the timing of identifying talent. I mentioned the relative age effect. We'll get to that. As well as the timing of different kinds of training that the person does. And then at its broadest, if we want to go really big, the question around is success and sporting performance the result of talent or is it training? And that's, it's, that's still an issue. Um, I think that over the last four or five years, people have become a lot more mature in how they've dealt with this. But there was a period where the likes of Malcolm Gladwell and Matthew Syed really created a convoluted understanding of this this polarization between talent and training and it was it was unhelpful and potentially even destructive and so we've got a more mature understanding now but we're going to just revisit that in this presentation and then of course you get the specifics which are those operational aspects I mentioned up front and I say everything else you'll hear this weekend you you unfortunately won't um, because at the two conferences that I spoke at the presentations after mine went into a lot more detail around how do we identify young athletes, what are the psychological factors, what are the physiological predictors, and those are things that you can certainly read up on. I'm going to touch them much less than I am the concepts. So just in terms of understanding Talent ID, the, it's, it's basic and really limited, but you've, you've probably seen this classic pyramid, which shows generally how someone's supposed to evolve or move from their introduction to a sport to the top of the pyramid where they are that world or Olympic champion. This is an example of a really basic one which was probably produced here in South Africa. This is a more fancy one from the Scottish Olympic uh, organization. Um, and what you've got is a two-dimensional model. So it's a little limited in that regard because what it shows you is the, the depth or the volume on the x-axis and then time or skill on the y-axis. And what it does show is that the system is designed to take as many people from the bottom and filter them progressively. So they'll go from basic introduction to the sport into youth sport, junior, senior, performance, elite, and then hopefully one day they'll end up on the top step of that podium. And this system is, as I say, there are filters at every single level based and, and, and your ability to move from one level to the next through those filters is a function of your skill. The problem is that there's also biological factors and environmental factors which can confuse it. And that's why this two-dimensional model is a little bit limited. But nevertheless, let's use it as a framework. And we can basically look then at what we see as talent today, that 12 or 13-year-old that you can identify, is the result of inputs, which are the things you identify, and which you then work with to produce the output. So just on the inputs, we have factors that are uncontrollable to you as a teacher, a parent, a coach. Uh, they include genetics, I suppose. If you're the parent of a child, then you are responsible for their genetics, but it's not something you can change. And they also include environmental factors. And, and that's important to understand that some aspects in the first 12 or 13 years of a young athlete's life are environmentally um, stimulated or induced and you have no control over them. They've happened already. They are not necessarily cast in stone 
but you're seeing an athlete who is a function of their environment before you ever saw them. And then on the right hand side are the controllable factors, which again includes the environment, because that's what the system is trying to create. So if we think about New Zealand's rugby, for instance, or Kenyan athletics, what you've got there is an environment that is conducive to developing 13 or 14 year olds who look like future champions. Because there are good school systems, they're physically active in the case of Kenya, they, they do all the things that are going to produce a good looking or a potentially champion like looking athlete at the age of 13 or 14. And then of course there's training because by the time you see a, a young 12 or 13 year old, that athlete may have had no training and they may have actually had quite a lot and that's something you have to be mindful of. Once you've identified the talent, next comes perhaps the more important component because talent ideas, it's, it's, not, it's not a once-off, that would be incorrect to say, but it's the thing you have the least control over. What you do have control over is the management or development of that talent and so that's where understandably and, and correctly most of the energy and effort goes into. And the result, of course, is output, which is realized potential. So that's what we want to do. We want to take someone who looks like a future champion, who expresses talent or predisposition or whatever you want to call it, and we want to produce an Olympic medalist or a champion or a person who's active lifelong in sport, depends on your objectives. So just on that regard, the, the fundamental justification for talent ID, I've given you some of the fundamental questions. This is the justification. The selection of talent is vital to any sports system because it informs or drives the allocation of resources. As much as we would like to think that we have unlimited resources, we don't. And so what you have to basically do is, let's say you've got a group of 300 young players or athletes, you've got a limited set of resources. We're talking here about financial, people, facilities, equipment. And you have to apply a filter so that you can spend those resources on the athletes who are most likely to be successful. So that's the bet that you make, is we've got limited money, we've got limited time, we've got limited people. Who are we best off spending those people time and that money on? So those are the chosen ones. Now, that's where it gets difficult. But the point is that talent ID is a budgeting decision because it drives the allocation of resources. Who do we spend the money on? When do we spend it? And how do we spend it? Those are the key questions that you, you make or, or have to ask when you are taking these decisions around talent ID. So we will pick this up in the second installment at this slide, but that's basically the fundamental questions around talent ID and the fundamental justification for why the identification of talent matters. And that's that for installment number one, which I hope was thought-provoking and stimulates a little bit of lateral thinking in you. I've got nothing else to add to it other than to say that you can look forward to the second part in the coming days, hopefully by the end of the week. And in that part, I'll be looking at inefficiencies and challenging you to think a little bit about how much inefficiency you're willing to accept and why those inefficiencies exist. So do join me then.